Welcome to another installment of Donning the Armor. This morning we will begin in Leviticus chapter 15, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When a man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. You know, that kind of goes without saying, you would think. But once again, fledgling nation, baby steps. And this is going to be an interesting thing because it's also talking about sickness. It's talking about sexual discharges. It is speaking about things that need to be done. It doesn't necessarily make people immorally unclean. It's not a moral issue, but a, once again, a hygienic issue. And this shall be his uncleanness in regard to his discharge, whether his body runs with his discharge or his body is stopped up by his discharge. It is his uncleanliness. Basically talking about whether or not you have diarrhea or you are constipated. Basically, if your discharge is making you unclean in your sickness. This is speaking about people who are sick in different ways, whether or not this is coming out of you or not. It uh, Every bed is unclean on which he who has the discharge lies, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So basically, you're sick. You sleep in your bed. The bed's going to be sick. You don't, you know, you, you're going to have to change your sheets. Well, in this, with everything that they have, basically everything he's touching is now going to be considered unclean for a time until it's cleaned uh, physically because the sickness and the germs are going to go on to the next person. Basically, it's, it's limiting things that are contagious from infecting other people and making them sick as well. Because back in these days, diarrhea was deadly. I mean, in this day and age now, even diarrhea for a baby is deadly. They, you, they can't replace the water quick enough. The, the, they can't hydrate quick enough because water is deadly to a baby. So they can't hydrate themselves. So diarrhea can be deadly to a baby. Your baby has diarrhea, take it to a doctor because it probably needs it. But this is limiting the way that people are sick because they didn't have the antibiotics, things that we have now. God is taking them in the world they live and teaching them how to live in it. So if you end up touching his bed, touching his clothes, you need to wash yourself and make sure you are okay and you're unclean until evening. He who sits on anything on which he who has the discharge sat shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And he who touches the body of him who has the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Limiting the spread of germs. We teach this now still. You touch something, go wash your hands with soap. Go wash your hands with soap. You sneeze, go wash your hands with soap. You help somebody who's sick, wash your hands with soap. Limiting the spread of germs. If he who has the discharge spits on him who is clean... Then he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. It's not really spitting as in literally spitting on someone. That's, I mean, also be the last time that person ever helped them. More than likely, this is speaking to somebody who sneezes on someone else. Their spittle gets on someone who's clean. If I'm sick and I sneeze on you, you're going to want to go clean yourself. You're going to want to go bathe because you don't want what I have. Any saddle on which he who has the discharge rides shall be unclean. Whoever touches anything that has that was under him shall be unclean until evening. He who carries any of these things shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever the one who has the discharge touches and has not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. The vessel of earth that he who has the discharge touches shall be broken and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. Once again, limiting the spread of germs, wood, metal, those things, you're going to wash them. The earthen vessels were normally kept to keep things in water jugs, jugs of flour, jugs of salted meat, 
those things need to be destroyed because it's seen as having been contaminated by his sickness. Just destroy it and start over. You do not want to spread the germs and the sickness he has throughout the camp. And when he who has the discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes and bathe his body in running water. Then he shall be clean. So after he's done, he's going to then count seven days after his sickness for his ritual cleansing, wash his clothes, bathe his body in running water, not still water. That way it's continuing to wash away from him. And then he's clean. On the eighth day, he shall take for himself two turtle doves and two pigeons and come before the Lord to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and give them to the priest. Then the priest shall offer them the one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord because of his discharge. This is because he's unclean. It's a sin offering, not because being sick is a sin and not necessarily because his sin is what made him sick. This is why a lot of Jews, even up to Jesus' time, would believe that as the disciples would ask, who sinned, Lord, this man or his parents? It's not necessarily sin that made him sick, but these offerings would make him be in atonement for the Lord because of his sickness, because of his uncleanliness. Now he is clean in returning and now in a state of being at one with the Lord so he can return to proper worship before the Lord. If any man has an omission of semen, then he shall wash all his body in water and be unclean until evening. And any garment and any leather on which there is semen, it shall be washed with water and be unclean until evening. Also, when a woman lies with a man and there is an omission of semen, they shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So, sexual relations between... This is not talking about adultery. This is not talking about immorality. So this must, because it's not talking about sinfulness, it is talking about the relations, a normal, healthy relation between a married couple. That this emission of semen is now going to need to be cleansed because it is an unclean thing. It is a discharge from your body is going to be treated as unclean. It is unclean for ceremonial and ritualistic reasons for worship of proper worship before the Lord, not because of a moral failing on the people. Because God has gifted married couples sex. We should enjoy it and we should use it to procreate. And when it does, we are unclean. We need to wash. That is the way the law worked. Nothing immoral about this because he's not speaking of immorality. He is not speaking of sexual deviancy in any way. He's just speaking of natural, beautiful sexual relations between a married couple. I don't think I've said all those words in a sentence in my life. Once again, though, Bible, not a children's book. It is a, bi it is a book meant for adults and people. That's why we filter this stuff out for children. But if you go to buy a children's Bible, a Bible meant for children, a study Bible, an adventure Bible, I have a Veggie Tales Bible for my son. He wanted it, so I bought him because, I mean, why not just add up to the Bibles we have in the house? That Bible still has the word semen in it. Once again, I don't think I've said semen this much in my life. But that Bible is geared towards children but they don't change the word of God because it is the word of God and all word of God is edifying. And it's something we need to discuss with our children at some point. And us as their parents are the ones who get to decide when that time is, not some governmental agency that calls himself school district. Not going to rant. Picking back up in 19. If a woman has a discharge and the discharge from her body is blood, she shall be set apart seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. So this, when we were talking about the giving birth, it said she will be counted for her normal length of time, and then an extra set of time on top of that. That seven days, she shall be set apart for seven days. And normally, menstrual cycle lasts 
you know, three, three, sometimes four days anyway. So it's an extra couple days to make sure everything runs flu through and you are then back to being clean after you've done what you need to do. Everything that she lies on during her impurity shall be unclean. Also, everything that she sits on shall be unclean. Whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever touches anything that she sat on shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. If anything is on her bed or on anything on which she sits when he touches it, he shall be unclean until evening. And if any man lies with her at all so that her impurity is on him, he shall be unclean seven days in every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. Not even describing a sexual relationship here. It's just literally if he's sleeping next to his wife and her impurity gets on him, he's now also unclean seven days. Because it's not a condemnation of a woman having her period, which is what I've seen unbelievers talk about. Oh, well, they need to put her away for seven days because her period's unclean. It's a normal thing. God created it. Why is he so evil? No, it's because diseases are bloodborne. <laughs> so limiting people's exposure to your bleeding is good for the public health of the congregation. All of these things that we've been covering recently are just public health issues by God. You had dietary issues and now you have public health issues. This once again is bloodborne pathogens. Don't go near someone's blood. It is unclean. Even if it's coming out of a woman, it's still unclean because it's blood. It's not something you should be near. It makes you unclean. You need to clean yourself when you're near it. That's it. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days other than the time of her customary impurity, or if it runs beyond her usual time of impurity, all the days of her unclean discharge shall be as the days of her customary impurity. Shall, she shall be unclean. Meaning, you're going to be unclean for as long as your period's going on. If it goes longer, it goes longer. You're still unclean. Which this leads into the... Uh, scene we see with Jesus and the woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. She has had her period for 12 years. She has, as Luke points out, done everything she could do. She has gone to every doctor. She has wasted away all of her money because the doctors then didn't have modern medicine. And this is a problem that might not have been cured by modern medicine anyway. But the problems she had then were... I don't know, what would you call it? Homeopathic, holistic healing. And you know what they call homeopathic medicine that works? Alternative medicine that works? Medicine. So in this case, we see that the doctor, Luke, is pointing out that this woman tried everything she could to become pure, to become clean, to become cured. But it was her faith in Christ. Touching his garment had nothing to do with it. It was her faith in him to heal her of her sickness that cleaned her. She was impure that entire time. Even touching the hem of his robe made him impure. And that's why the people around her got very angry at first. Until Jesus called her daughter. Daughter, you shall be healed. Daughter. The only woman we see him called daughter a term used by a loving God to one of his children who has placed her faith in him, who is in so much pain and desperation for his healing hands. Daughter. So when you look at this and you hear unbelievers talk about this discharge and this is how Bible is running down women, think about that. There is a woman suffering and instead of condemning her, instead of sending her away, instead of looking on her in disgust, Jesus calls her daughter. Because that is how close of a relationship he has with us and how loved we are by him. 
and how much he seeks to care for us every step of our lives. Every bed on which she lies all her days of her discharge shall be to her as the bed of her impurity, and whatever she sits on shall be unclean as the uncleanliness of her impurity. Whoever touches those things shall be unclean. He shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, then she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves, two young pigeons, and bring them to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the priest shall offer one of them as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering, and the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for the discharge of her uncleanliness. So in this case, because it was an unnatural menstrual cycle, something else was going on that needed to be pushed through her system. In this case, they needed to wait an extra seven days, make sure she isn't having an issue going further then she can make atonement before the Lord for her on that eighth day. Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. That's another reason. You want to separate the children of Israel that are unclean, because if you go to the Lord in an unclean fashion, in a defiled manner, he will you will suffer his consequences because you will not defile his tabernacle. You will not defile his dwelling place that is to be among the people and shared among the people. This is the law for one who has a discharge and for him who emits semen and is unclean thereby and for her who is indisposed because of her customary impurity and for one who has a discharge, either man or woman, and for him who lies with her who is unclean. So, this is all the things that's being prescribed, public health reasons, and reasons to keep themselves pure before the Lord. Pure so that they go to him for worship in a correct and righteous way. So, moving on to chapter 16. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of his two, the, two, the two sons of Aaron, when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord, to, told, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. So this is another reason why possibly Nadab and Abihu were killed. Because you do not just get to come into the holy place whenever you want because you're a priest. There are certain ways to do things as the Lord has commanded you. You will not do things in a debased way and you will not do things because you decide you want to do it. You are going to do it by my rules. Because this is my place. I will appear in the cloud above that mercy seat. There's going to be a cloud over that mercy seat, over the ark. I will be inside that. My presence will be there. So you must come in a way that is, is as perfect as humanly possible. As holy as possible because I am holy and I am there. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. These are not the same garments as the ephod and the robes and the turban with the crown. This is the day of atonement. This is Yom Kippur. This is the one day a year that the high priest and the high priest alone will go inside the veil to the Holy of Holies in before the Ark of the Covenant and offer these sacrifices, this blood before the Lord for atonement of the congregation, for forgiveness and blotting out of their sins for this one year, this covering of their sinfulness. 
this one day, he is able to do it. And there are special linen garments that these are to be done that are set apart for this one day. They are holy, set apart garments for this day of atonement. Therefore, he shall wash his body in water and put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and let it go into, let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now you start to wonder which one's actually getting off. Which one is the one that is a blessing? The goat that gets to die for the Lord as a sin offering or the one that actually gets to live but gets sent away into the wilderness where it's more than likely just going to become a meal for wolves and lions. Because you always think of the scapegoat as one that's getting away, it that is being foisted upon so that all the blame goes on it. And this is what's happening. But it's also the one not being killed. So sometimes we need to remember it's better to die for the honor of the Lord and in a way that glorifies him than to live in the world. We are told to die to ourselves every day, meaning we are to die to our own nature and live for him and die to the world die to the world so we can live for him that is what this that is what the sin offering goat is doing the scapegoat is allowing to live but live in a dark lonely wicked world to wander alone and Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bull as a sin offering which is for himself then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his fingers seven times. So as for my understanding, this would mean that he would actually have to come in and circle around the Ark of the Covenant to the backside and sprinkle seven times the blood, a sign of completeness before the Lord. He shall put forth the sweet incense before the Lord so he does not die, so that he is coming in obedience and making his offering to the Lord in a way that is prescribed by the Lord. Everything here is about the obedience in carrying out the sacrifice more than the sacrifice itself. It sounds harsh, but the Lord is demanding obedience for the person who is standing as the spiritual leader of his people. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgression for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting, which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. So that he is cleaning, he is, he is doing this to clean the sins of the people for the year because the Lord resides among them. The Lord is residing among them in their uncleanliness. And this is to atone for the sins that they have done in the presence of the Lord, literally. His tabernacle of meeting is in their presence and they're doing these sins, knowingly or unknowingly, in his presence. But it is interesting that even 
the high priest himself needs to make a sacrifice for himself to atone for his sin, knowing or unknowing, and those of his family. Something that our high priest, Jesus Christ, did not have to do because he is completely sinless. He is without sin. Even if we go back to the idea of him going with Joseph and Mary to offer up the two turtle doves at the temple after his birth on the eighth day. And people say, well, that's a sign that he's a sinner. That's a sign of Mary offering up the sacrifice as meant to be done after giving birth. It is a sacrifice for a new child coming in coming into a world of sin. Jesus was sinless, the only sinless person to have ever lived because the permanent sacrifice to blot out all sin needed to be sinless and needed to be man, needed to be a human. The only way any human being was capable of being sinless was for it to be God himself. No human being was capable of being sinless, regardless of what church tradition you belong to that teaches you otherwise. Because if that's the case, then Jesus didn't need to be the sacrifice because God was only required to be the sacrifice in so far as he was the only one capable of being sinless. If anyone else could have been the sacrifice, it would almost be sinful for them not to to put themselves forward to take his place so his ministry could continue. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for the assembly of all the Israel. So he has got to be alone. No one else is to be there. Only the high priest. No other priests. No one, period. Just the high priest alone. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. And shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel doing every year what they did when they first consecrated the tabernacle. This is to be done every year to re-consecrate it from the uncleanliness of where it resided. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lie both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. Uh, um, it, the King James says a fit man, basically someone who's actually capable of taking the goat out. The goat shall bear on itself all the iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat into the wilderness. So you're saying someone who is fit and capable to take the goat out and survive the trip take it to an uninhabited land, and release the goat into the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting, shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place, put on his garments, and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, and make atonement for himself and for the people. The fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar, and he who released the goat as the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. So the person, Aaron has to change his clothes, rewash himself, put on his more priestly garments, and then the person who took the goat out is made unclean by touching the scapegoat and needs to now wash himself in. He doesn't have to wait until evening. He is clean as soon as he is finished washing and can come back into the camp. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, though whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp, and they shall burn in the fire of their skins, their flesh, and their offal. Those who who 
And then he who burns them shall wash his clothes, bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. We remember this when we were studying the sin offerings that you need to take it outside the camp to the place of the ashes and burn them there. This shall be a statute forever for you in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month. You shall afflict your souls and do not no work at all. You are to grieve yourself. You are to afflict yourself by grief because of all that had to be done to work for your atonement. This is now a Sabbath day. You're not going to do any work and you're just going to worry and grieve and reflect on your your sin and the forgiveness God has offered for it. This is why as much as our Western society, especially the U.S., has tried to put a lot of um, relevance upon Hanukkah because it happens around Christmas and they want to promote diversity of holidays because they don't like that the country is so Christian. But to a Jewish person... Hanukkah is nowhere near the holiest of days. You have Passover and you have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Those are the days they care about most. Hanukkah, they like Hanukkah. It's awesome. But it is not Yom Kippur. It is not this Day of Atonement. This is the day that they feel the most closest to God. I don't even think that's a word. This is how, when they feel the most close to God because this is the day where they reflect on the sins they committed and, this, and the forgiveness he offers them through the sacrifices they make. Whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. So there's no work to be done, whether it's a native person or a stranger. If a stranger, because you're going to be in the land of Canaan, that's going to be your promised land now. If a stranger is coming in, they also are not allowed to do work. This is a holy, holy day for you. It is to be set apart from all other days. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you. You shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever, and the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on linen clothes and garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year as he did and he did as the Lord commanded Moses. So all this would be to continue, to be continuing this day of atonement throughout the history of Israel. The question is, what do they do now that they're not allowed to do these things? I'm not a Orthodox Jew. I can't answer that question. But it was to be a statute, is to be a day set apart from almost all other days, this day, once a year, to act as a day of atonement for all their sins. A special day above and beyond all other days. Something that we don't really have an analog for in Christianity outside of Easter, Resurrection Sunday. That is a day we celebrate our atonement because of the sacrifice and work of Christ. That Resurrection Sunday, when the Lord came back, defeated death, and returned to earth in his glorified body came back from the dead and dwelled another 40 days before ascending into heaven but that day when death was arrested was defeated for those who placed their faith in him that day is the closest we get to this but that day for us is one of a sacrifice made one time. 
and then we remember that day. We do it in remembrance of him. We celebrate in remembrance of him. We worship in remembrance of him. This day for the Jewish people was something they would have to do year after year after year, sacrificing these animals, bringing forth this holy day where the high priest would literally put his life on the line to go into the holiest of holies in a clean state. Because if he went in unclean, he was not coming back out alive. He was to go in and make atonement for the sins of all the people and for his own sins because he was sinful. The high priest was sinful. Something our high priest isn't. So much of this, the Day of Atonement, these sacrifices, these offerings, should make us as Christians living in the covenant of grace so grateful and so appreciative of the things that the Lord has given us, of these, this way of living where we are no longer under this law, having to sacrifice and deal with this rough, rocky road that these people had to worry about, this heart-rending thing of having to give up animals that you raised and watching them be slaughtered, having to watch blood of innocent, innocent creatures poured out for your iniquity, having to watch things die because you aren't living the way you should be, having to go through these days and these offerings time and time again because you can't live in a right standing of God by yourself. So blessed to live in this day and age when we had that sacrifice but one time. And now all we need to do is remember it, trust in it, and accept the gift that was given to us. We are atoned for but one time. One time that sacrifice was made. And it is in constant existence. The slate is wiped clean for all who place their trust in him. We don't then need to go and do something else to prove our atonement's real. It is real because he says it's real. And once we trust in that, we are justified because of it. One time in this covenant of grace, Christ was crucified. One time he died. He rose again. And because of that, we have the ability to rise again in death. As he laid in a grave and rose from it, so shall we lay in a grave and rise from it as well. Because when we, to be absent of the body is to be present to the Lord. And when we are present in the Lord, we want to be present, cloaked in his righteousness. We want to be arraigned for the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the only way to do that is to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. To place yourself under his authority. Trust that God has come in the form of man. Humbled himself. Died to take on sins. To atone for the sinful wickedness that this world has foisted upon us, that our souls crave, that our hearts wish to live in, that we are atoned by his blood completely because we trust his promises. One time, not year after year, as these unfortunate souls had to do. But anyway, that's where we shall end for today. I hope this was fruitful for you. I hope to see you again next time. But until then, be blessed.